All right, praise the Lord in the name of Jesus. We're back with uh, Voice in the Word. And uh, we always seem to have te technical difficulties every time that we try to uh, do something, you know, technical. Uh, the Bible does say that the devil is the prince of the powers of the air, Ephesians 2 and 2. Now, I don't know if that's what it is or not, but it definitely seems like it, especially when I do something. Eh, I don't want to be a, you know, I mean, a cry baby. So I'm just going to go ahead and endeavor to voice in the word okay all right in the book of first john chapter four what we're going to be talking about there's no unconditional love there's no unconditional love we, we talk about this unconditional love stuff and i think this has caused a lot of people to mistreat each other men can mistreat women women mistreat men parents mistreat their children children mistreat their parents on and on and even mistreat God, which is the ultimate of what I'm talking about, that we mistreat God. We treat, mistreat ourselves and God. Because if you think that something is unconditional, you think you can do what you want to do. Praise the Lord. But let's read the book. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. All right. It didn't say that God is unconditional love. It said that God is love. Okay. Now let's read the uh the the verses before that, starting at verse one. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. So that means you have to have a walk with Jesus Christ and an experience with Jesus Christ in order to try the spirit. Because you just can't try the spirit with your flesh because you're going to be looking at things from a fleshly point of view. And this is why a lot of people believe in unconditional love. But I plan to voice you in the word today, allow you to see what God's voice in the word is and what the apostles voice in the word is. So you can see, so you can start voicing what the word really says. Now, we already read um, the eighth verse that said God is love. It didn't say God is unconditional love. So right now we already knocked out the unconditional already as we begin okay now try the spirit of course you can't try the spirit if you have the wrong spirit because if you have a wrong spirit your spirit is going to try things wrong you have the flesh in you you're going to be trying things according to the fleshly spirit but if you're going by the word of god the pure unadulterated word of god all right praise the lord now but try the spirits whether they are of god because many false prophets are going out into the world. Many people are lying. Praise the Lord. They're changing things. They, they uh, slick, like Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and on. He was like, I didn't come with you with excellence of speech, with men's wisdom, because that prophet is nothing. He said, I just came to you, amen, voicing the word of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Praise the Lord. Hereby know we the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is of God. And I'm quite sure it's not, when it's this confession, it's not just a confession with the mouth, like we could quote in Romans 10 and 9, if a, if a man, con if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, confession shall be made into salvation. Amen. Let's go to Romans 10 and 9, because a lot of people do that for quick uh, soul winning. And there's, I don't think there's no such thing as quick soul winning. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And we go to the ninth verse of Romans 10, that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I think that... A lot of people just go and tell you that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, by faith you've already got everything. Okay. That that sounds pretty good. But what happens if they stop believing on that which they have faith in? So what happens to the Holy Ghost and everything and all that salvation? It Doesn't it go down the drain? Yeah, God doesn't leave you, but you can leave God. Okay, let's go back. So I don't think that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, it's talking about just confessing with the mouth that Jesus came into, you know, uh, into the flesh. It means believe, uh, uh, such a confession 
that it takes over your mind and gets into your mind and gets into your mind. Just like the confession in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, your confession shall but be made to salvation. And man believeth in the heart. That means in your head, not your chest, your head. You see, I don't keep rubbing my head because it got to get all in your cerebrum, cerebellum, your left and right hemisphere. Get in your subconscious that is so much a part of you that it, it that your confession means this is what you truly believe. Because some people say, I love you, but they don't mean it. They're the biggest, slickest liars in the world, male and female. And then we talk about unconditional love. Really? How many love songs? And baby, I won't leave you. I'll always be with you. And where's that baby at now? Men and women have sung those songs. I'll love you. I'll never leave you. Oh, God. But how many men have they been with? How many women have they been with? How many have we been with? Praise the Lord. Let's put ourselves into the equation so that we can really get hit home with this. So is love really unconditional with you? Or if his love is so unconditional, how come you're not with the man that you originally said you love, the woman that you originally said you love? Not unconditional. All right. Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is of God. So is the confession is not just a confession of the mouth. It means it's taking root in you. Praise the Lord. Take root in you so that when you confess it, it's a, your life proves it. Like James chapter 2 verses 19 says that the devil believes in tremble, but the devil doesn't have any works because that book is about faith without works is dead. So the book of James says, you show me faith that's no, with no works, and I'll show you faith with works. Meaning if you believe in God, it ought to show something. You ought to show some sign. Come on and say amen. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is not of God. You have a lot of religions that talk about Jesus just being a prophet and stuff like that, but they don't say that he's the Savior that's coming in the flesh. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Yes, the Antichrist is already in the world. But it says, for the believers that believe in Christ, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, those that don't believe that Jesus has come. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. See, the world is not going to hear the gospel unless God take the blindness off their, under, their ears. You have to understand that. They cannot see the gospel unless God takes the blindness off their ears. If you worldly, you can't understand what I'm saying right now. I have to pray. In the name of you. That's for me and God. So don't worry about it. You don't have to worry. What did he just do? What is he going crazy? No. That's my prayer language to God. Just like the Muslims say you got to speak Arabic. There's an unknown language that you receive when you come to God. First, uh, first Corinthians chapter 14, the first three or four verses let you know that. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 9, uh, well, if you have not the spirit of God, you're none of his. And as you go down further in Romans chapter 8, it says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, we have not received the spirit of bondage again, the spirit, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But why did it say Abba? Why didn't it just say Father, Father? Because there's another way to say Father in the tongue of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks about you're not speaking to men, but you're speaking to God. So, amen, as I'm speaking to you in the language that you understand, I'll also speak to God, asking God to strengthen me. My spirit needs help. Amen, because when you give these type of messages, when you voice this type of word, Folk, amen, the, the, the devils are fighting you. Demons are in the air. The, the prince of uh, principalities and spiritual weaknesses and darkness comes against you. Now, what are we talking about? So you don't get lost in the song. We are talking about there's no such thing as unconditional love with God. And we're going to prove it to you in the word of God. Amen. Now, 1 John chapter 4, we're in verse 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world and the world heareth them. We who have been saved in Jesus Christ, we are of God, and he that knoweth God heareth us. If you're gonna, if you of God, you're gonna hear what I'm saying. He that is not of God don't hear what we're saying. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If you won't hear what I'm saying, you're in the spirit of error. Because I'm gonna give you according, I'm gonna voice the word according to what the word voices. I'm not gonna voice it some no some other way. I'm gonna voice the word just the way the word is voiced. Praise the Lord, beloved. 
First John 4, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7. The love let us love one another. For love is of God. So in other words, you got to come to God in order to love. And notice it didn't say unconditionally love one another. It didn't say that. It said love one another. So in order to love, you got to come to God who is love. Notice now, for love, it didn't say unconditional love. For love is of God. Love is of God. It didn't say unconditional love, beloved. Let's be honest with one another. That's an added. Somebody threw that in there. And I'm going to show you why they threw it in there. Because if you put unconditional in, that means there's nothing that you have to do to require love. That sounds kind of tough. And even if love for the lover, if they are an unconditional lover, right? Meaning they are, uh, let's take God, who is love. That's who is originally love, right? Let's say right here in 1 John verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, um, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Okay, God is love. So unconditionally, no matter what we come up with, God is love, right? He is who he is unconditionally. Now, he's not who he is on condition. Well, really, that's still not going to make no sense to me because I'm going to try to throw that unconditional in for you to help it work either way. God is God. He's God because he's God. That's the condition of who he is. He's love. But now, does he love you unconditionally? If he's God, sure he does. He loves you because he's God, that's, which is really the condition of the unconditional, right? But watch this. Because he loves you, he requires of you a condition. So whoever said God loves you unconditionally, maybe if they're just saying God just loves you, right? Because God is love. Because it does say that God is love, right? But watch this. Watch what I'm going to bring out. Walk with me, right? Let's say you're right. God loves you unconditionally. Yeah, we're going to prove this one. He loves you because he's God. He can't help but love you. He can't help but be God. It's just like I can't help but be who I am. You can't help but be who you are. The condition of the unconditioned is you are who you are. Now, God is who he is. He's love, right? Unconditionally. That's what we say. He's unconditionally. Unconditionally a loving God. Okay, that's who he is. But now the question is, is there uncondition on the love that he has for you? Or does he require? Now, let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews. Chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go to verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 12. And pay attention to verse 8. 6, 8, and 14, um, Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastened. That means he chastises and he scourges. That means beats every son whom he receiveth. Wow. So you mean God is going to beat you, he's going to scourge you, and he's going to chastise you if there's no condition? So he's just a mean God, huh? I thought he was the God of love. He is, according to the scripture. So it can't mean what we've been saying. It means he must be a demonic message to, send to make us think that, that God doesn't scold us. The scripture right here is saying, for who the Lord loves, he chastens. What does the word chasten mean? It means he rebukes. He punishes. He beats. He gives them a spanking. He corrects them. Wow. Somebody sent us a messed up message. It doesn't say that God don't, that it's unconditional. You can do what you want to do. And same thing with the preacher of God. Let's go to 2 uh, Timothy chapter 4. Because when you talk hard to people and tell them what to do, oh, you don't love, you don't, you ain't speaking in love, brother. You're out, you're so out of love. God is a God of love. Well, let's go to the book. I charge thee, this is 2 Timothy chapter 4 for the preacher, for the man of God. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant. That means, amen, be ready at all times. And, 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 and just don't, come on, trust in the spirit. Out of all, reprove. 
Same thing it just said in, in the book about God. Rebuke, same thing what it just said in Hebrews about God. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So if the time is coming where they will not endure sound doctrine, that means they're supposed to endure sound doctrine. That means so they won't hear, they don't want to hear what you're saying in sound doctrine. They don't want to hear what you're saying in sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heat to themselves, teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And shall be turned unto fables, which means lies. Wow. So that means you have to listen to the truth. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastised. And we just, if you look up the word chastise, you'll find the word rebuke, uh, punish, and beat. So the punishment is not for nothing. God is not evil. He's love. So that means when you get out of control, God comes to bring you back in control. He even sends ministers to rebuke you, to reprove you, to correct you, to spank you in the word. So all you liars, excuse me, that's talking about God is a God of unconditioned, and then you throw in there, you, you ain't supposed to judge. You're not supposed to judge. So don't you judge, since that's what you say. But there's scripture that's saying the man of God judges all things. I think 1 Corinthians 2.15. Let's go to 1 Corinthians and see if I'm correct. You know what I mean? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2.15. And it's talking about the man of God. So if you're not a man of God, and, and even a parent has to correct their child. In fact, if you continue reading that book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, it says that the, the parents rebuke you and, and get on you. Uh, what did I say, 215? Well, let's go to 14. Again, going to 15. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him. Of course, you can't hear the true word of God if you are fool. Lord, help us. 14th chapter of Psalm. Amen. The fool that said in his heart, there's no God. And our Revelation, cha I mean, Matthew chapter 7 talks about, amen, here know you the fool and the wise. The ones that hear the word and do it is wise. But the ones that hear the word but just want to be a brainiac, just quoting scriptures for nothing, that's a fool. They won't do what the word says. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You've got to be in the spirit to understand the spiritual thing. All right, but he that is spiritual judges all things. Lord help us. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. That don't mean that man don't try to judge you. It means that God, their judgment don't stand. What somebody say about a, a true man of God, it doesn't matter with God. They just judge him. That's among the world. See, that's their own clique, the world. But what they judging don't mean nothing with God. So when it says, but he's judged of no man, that means that it, their, their judgment don't count. But what the man of God says counts because God is listening to the man of God. He's not listening to the world. It's just like when you go to court. The judge not listening to you. He's listening to the attorney. He, the, him and the attorney having, have a mind set together. They're part of the same fraternity. They are one. They have taught the same thing. So you need the attorney. The attorney don't need you per se. Okay? You need the attorney. All right? Because the attorney knows what to say to the judge. Jesus is that attorney. He knows what to say to God. You don't know what to say to God. That's why we need the spirit of God. And that's why for all of those that don't believe in speaking in tongues, you don't have to believe in speaking in tongues because I say it. But voice in the word. What about Acts chapter 19 that says, amen, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now, we ain't getting off the point of God's love. We're not getting off the point of unconditional love because there's no unconditional love. Because if there was an unconditional love, what are you getting chastised for in the word of God? If there's no uh if there's no if there's if there's no condition. If everything is unconditional, I can do what I want. Why does first Corinthians chapter six? Oh, since we ended, uh did we finish first Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen? Verse fifteen. But he that is spiritual judges all things. See, when you're in the spirit, you judge all things. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. For those of you that believe in unconditional love, let's, let's prove it. 
Now, if you can come some other way and prove to me that I'm wrong, then I'll be glad to listen. But right now, you don't have a leg to stand on. Uh, uh, all right. Why am I missing something here? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All right, here you know. Let's go at the ninth verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Right now, it's just saying unrighteous. So if, if there was no condition, why would there be called anybody would be unrighteous if there's no condition? If everything is unconditional, why is there unrighteousness? Everybody would be right. Just like somebody said, who, who can say what is right? Who can say what is wrong? That's, that's what school and college has taught us. The question everything. Yet, watch the stupidity and the hip hypocrisy of even this the school system and the judge system. They tell you you can judge, you can challenge your father's and mother's authority, but you can't challenge the judge's authority per se, or you held in contempt of court. So it's like behind the curtain, the puppet master, the devil, is sending out some lies and hypocrisy and 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 and, and this uh, distorting the truth. And uh, confusion. As 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 33 says, God is not the author of confusion, but the devil is. Okay. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Start verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous, it says, ask the question. Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So right now, that's a condition right there. You have to be righteous to inherit the kingdom of God. I'm proving that unconditional love, unconditional love does not exist outside of just God being who he is. Because God conditions you. God chastises you. If he loves you, he can he chastises you. He spanks you. He gives you a word. It's the same with a good parent. If they don't never spank you, the Bible said you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Spoiled is not good. Spoiled people are not going to heaven. All right, let's finish reading 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That means you have to be righteous. Be not deceived. That means be not fooled. That means it's not, it's not without a condition. It's not unconditional, beloved. Uh, because why? Watch what it goes on to say. Be not deceived, neither the fornicator. Premarital sex or extramarital sex. Usually the, the book will... The, Dictionary will say extramarital sex. Now I'm going to say something about this. Since I'm in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, a lot of people talk about shacking. That's basically pre predominantly in the, in, the, in the people of color church. People of color. They use the word shacking. I stopped using that. Originally I was using the word shacking because I heard it in the church as I was coming up. But now, as an, as I'm going to go show it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Be, I believe that marriage was sanctioned by God. So does the average person in church, pastors and all. But usually pastors, when they tell you to get married, they tell you that your marriage is only right when the law legalizes it. I disagree with that. Let me say that emphatically. I disagree with that. And I'm going to show you. I didn't plan on showing you this, but it's in this book. So I might as well touch it while I'm on it. And I'm still talking about Love is not unconditional because here, even right here, it's talking about fornication, which is extramarital sex, idolatry, having anything that you put before God, person, place, or thing, nor adulterers, cheating on your husband or your wife, effeminate, that means sissified men, homosexual men, so that will also cover masculine acting women, lesbian women which are homosexual as well, homosexual covers male and female, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexual. So that means even if you're not a homosexual, let's go back to the word effeminate, you can't be a sissified man, even though you may not be dating another man, you can't be sissified. You must pray to God to make you the, a man. Get that girliness out of you. Same thing with a woman, talking about she's a tomboy. Tom is a boy, so it's Tom girl. God does not have Tom being girl or girl being Tom. Sorry, no. Uh -uh. So you ask the question, what shall you do? Get in that conditional love and start walking within the condition. Stop talking about it's unconditional and get into the condition, which is holy. 
Ayalaboshe, Halaisha. How that goes for me, Hadaboshe, Talaboshe. Haya, glory in the name of God. Help me with this word, God. Hallelujah. Holiness is for everybody. Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Follow peace with all men. Holiness without no man shall see the Lord. Condition. No holiness, you won't see God. No peace, you won't see God. So when somebody's talking to you about things that you don't like, but they're holy things, righteous things, they're not being unpeaceful. It's you being unpeaceful because the demons and you are fighting against the trueness of God. And then you want to come up with the word judging. You're not loving. You don't care. You don't really have the love of God. That's you that don't have the love of God because you don't want to obey. You have the spirit of rebellion. First Samuel 15, verses 21 to 23. You don't want to obey, and you've got rebellious, and that's witchcraft in you. And that's and witchcraft is slick. Witchcraft tries to make you think you're walking in love, which is really disobedience, and think you can do what you want to do, claiming that you're obeying God. Yeah, you're obeying Satan, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, and not the God of the whole universe, Jehovah, through Jesus Christ. Oh, break it down. Okay. Nor... 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Nor thieves. That means you got to can't be a thief. Condition is you got to stop stealing. Nor covetous. That means you got to stop desiring. You want to keep up with everything that's the trend, everything that's the fad. As soon as you see somebody else with something you want, the Bible said don't be a covetous. Don't and go to Exodus 20. Don't covet your neighbor's house, wife, a car, nothing that belongs to your neighbor. Don't want what they have. God is able to bless you. Ephesians 3 and 20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. But the thing is, it's not about your will, it's about God's will. Isn't that what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6? And forgiveness? And then it says, if you don't forgive after the prayer was made, the 14th verse of Matthew chapter 6, it says, for if you won't forgive, God won't forgive you. Condition, you got to be a forgiver. Some, some of us just talk about being a giver. But you have to be a forgiver. Forgive people. And it's hard to forgive. Yes, especially when people do some hateful things to you. But you, uh, 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 Psalm 51 and 10 says, Create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit. That's why you got to be holy. That's why you need a holy ghost. What have you done that proves you holy, man, that don't believe in speaking in tongues? I know you can say the devil speaks in tongues. The devil speaks in English. He speaks in French. He speaks in Spanish. He speaks in every language. But do whatever language you speak, you mean you're going to stop speaking because that the devil speaks? The devil walks too. The devil, the devil, uh, he functions. Do you want to stop functioning because the devil functions? So that's a stupid statement. The devil speaks in tongues. You better get everything that God has for you. What you want to do is reach into the holiness of God. The holiness of God. And so whether you believe in speaking in tongue or not, in the word it says they spoke in tongue. On the day of Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one place on one accord. The cord, there came a sound from heaven as it were, a mind, and it filled all the place with this, and they appeared in them cloven tongues, and they spoke in tongues. You say, well, that's the gift of tongue. My pastor said that was the gift where they can speak another language. Well, you're going to be speaking another language. It's just going to be a language to God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the first few verses. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but I have to say it as the Spirit leads me. Follow after charity, which is love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So would it not be important to speak unto God in the language that God likes? It says you're not speaking unto men, but unto God. So don't you pray? So isn't there a scripture in the Bible, I think it's in Romans 8, says that we don't know how to pray as we ought? But the Spirit speaketh and maketh intercession for us with moanings and groans. So the Spirit has a language. So you need to take this speaking in an unknown tongue as the spiritual language of God. Because you speaking in the flesh, you're not doing nothing. God said he already know what you're talking about. He don't want to hear all that repetitive mumble jumble that we come to him with our natural fleshly language. Excuse me. But he that speaketh in an unknown tongue... Speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mystery. So when he's speaking to the mysterious God, doesn't First Timothy 3, uh, 16 says, 
without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received of the Lord. So without an argument, God is mysterious. No matter how much I think I know about God, there's so much more to know about God. No matter how much you think you know in God, there's so much more to know about God. Because without an argument, great is the mystery of godliness. And God manifested through Jesus Christ. That's what 1 Timothy 3.16 is getting into. Okay. He that speaketh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 again. We're back at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Praise the Lord. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh unto God. So dare you not, if you speak in the God or anybody else speaks in God in an unknown tongue, you say that's not important. You talking about speaking to God is not important? Speaking to God is not important? Now, some people say that if, you, if you're talking now in this language, that the devil don't understand you. I don't know if the devil doesn't understand you or not because the devil is a spiritual, unclean being. And he's been closer to God than you and I. He's talked to Jesus closer than you and I. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, Revelation. Where did Satan come from? From heaven. He fell from heaven. You trying to get to heaven. I'm trying to get there. Satan already been there and got demoted. But it does say that man does not understand what you're saying, but you talking to God. It does, it, God knows what you're saying. So wouldn't it be important to speak to a, in a language that man don't understand, can't get in your way, and God does understand? Praise the Lord. But when it comes to talking to man, you want to speak and prophesy to man in the edification and exhortation and comfort that man understands. But he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, he edifies himself. That's the, the spirit is edifying him. Amen. Through the spirit of God. You're talking to God. Okay. Then Paul said, I would that you all spoke with tongues. So he didn't tell you not to speak in tongues, uh, unknown tongues. But he said, rather that you prophesy. So for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. He's talking about in the church. In the church, he's not talking about your talk with God. He's talking about among other people that believe you. So when I speak in an unknown tongue, if you don't understand what I'm saying, don't worry about it. God understands what I'm saying. I'm going to say plenty for you to understand. Trust me. So you're not going to like what I'm saying unless you're in the spirit of God. All right. Number one, you can't be a thief. You can't be a liar. You can't be homosexual. You can't be an abuser. You're a homosexual. You can't be an a idol, idolater. You can't be an extortioner. You can't be stealing from people and extorting people. Because it says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you say that God is, is that the unconditional of God's love is based on not no condition, you're telling a lot. And then we go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For who the Lord loveth, he chats. That means he gets on him. He spanks them. He scored them. He beats them. Spanks them. Every son whom he received. It didn't say that one son. It said every son he received. Even Jesus went through and he was called the first begotten, the only begotten of God. Jesus said, let this cup pass from, from my lips, God. This is bitter cup of evil, sin, and death. But he said, nevertheless, not my will. That's what you and I have to pray when we start going through trials and tribulations. Are we being punished for something that we did? Then there's nothing to gripe about. You can go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to the end of the chapter on that. If you're getting punished for something you did and you was wrong, then there's no need griping. But if you're getting punished for living right, living holy, trying to do the right thing, and you're going through, then the Bible says that's held as greatness. Read 1 Peter chapter 2, all of it. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. If you endure chastisement, God dealeth with you. As with sons, for what son is he whom the father does not chase, does not chastise? So that means you got to endure the chastisement, go through the storm, go through the trial. I don't like trials and tribulations, but you have to go through it. But, verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8, but if you be without chastisement, where of all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. It says all the sons get a get a beat down. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. They get a beat down. 
Hold on, y'all joining fake, a whole lot of people are joining gangs and getting a beat down for living for the devil, for killing people for nothing, robbing people for murder, and for nothing, murdering people for nothing, going to prison, going to the devil's hell hole on the earth. Many becoming homosexuals and stuff like that, being turned out into prison by your own gang members. Then the prison is offering a, uh, some type of sovereignty by you joining Islam. They even have kosher food for you for the for people that say they Islam. Now you gotta ask yourself a question. A place where they don't care nothing about you, throw you in there and say you deserve to rot and die and be chastened, right? And you can eat slop just about, right? Well all of a sudden they're giving food for a kosher food for Islamic and yet you say you went to prison, a lot of you that are listening that have been to prison and, and, and I'm not talking to just believers, I'm talking to those of you that want to become believers. You go into the revolving door of the prison and you say that, you know, the government is foul, they they, they not judge they not just and you wanna follow follow some justice and equality. You know what I mean? And uh freedom, justice and equality. Then you go to prison and you join you find the only thing in prison you find may find Islam. They give you some what you call decent slop, kosher slop. Praise the Lord. I'm not making fun. I'm just saying so. And then so you embrace. It's like they change your appetite. You say, oh, Islam is the thing to be. Maybe they help protect you from homosexuals. So you got to ask yourself the question, my brothers and sisters. What is it about that's going on with Islam that's allowing it to be in the prison system so rampant? And if the government is wicked, like you saying, what wicked plan do they have that they allow kosher food in the name of Islam? What wickedness is going on with Islam that they allow them to pray in school, but they won't allow the Christians to pray? Now, you, and some of you, and I'm going to throw this out there for you, some of you that say the white man is the devil. That's what you say? You say you don't want to believe the scriptures of Christ because Christ is the white man's God. That's what you say. So the white man that you claim who has come in your community and do whatever, right? Not all, but some. You say that they evil, they the devil, but you'll take anything that they give you. Now they're giving you, along with other things, Islam in prison. In your school system, the same man that you said is wicked. So if he's wicked, because you couldn't take the discipline of Jesus Christ, because he said you got to be born again. Now, Islam on the moral level is doing nothing more than what the Christians have already said 600 years before the Quran was established. Nothing more. If you talk about a woman dressing modest, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You talk about not being a sissy, we read in that. We just read that in 1 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 4, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Not being a thief, not being a liar, not being abusers or homosexual, not being extortioner. That's already been established in the Bible. So the only thing the Quran has on the Bible is that they don't put Jesus as the Savior. So you went to an Arab man that's dead, but Jesus came out of the grave and sits on the right hand of majesty and power, which their book, the Quran, says that Jesus is the Messiah, says that he was the messenger of Allah, says that he was born of immaculate conception, says that Muhammad had no greatness. Muhammad killed, Jesus gave life. Muhammad murdered, Jesus gave life. Even if it was so-called for righteous killings, that they say righteous killings. Now, back to the unconditional love. You tried to escape the love of Jesus Christ because you found out that it was based on, when you heard it, based on condition. Yes, it is based on something. Let's go back to Hebrews 12. Because if the Lord loves you, he's going to chastise you. But if you be without chastisement, like all the other children, then you are a bastard. You're not a child. If God don't chastise you, you're not a child of God. Let's go to the ninth verse of Hebrews 12. Furthermore, we have had fathers, our own fathers, of the flesh, which correct us. And we gave them reverence. You're supposed to give your father reverence. Don't the Bible say honor your father and your mother? You gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of the spirits and live? See, your father, if you have a good father and mother on the earth, they spank you to send you in the right direction. 
Go to school, young man, young woman. Learn, young man, young woman. Stop doing bad things, young woman. Don't be a, 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 a pigsty. Don't keep your room like a pig. Pick up those dirty socks and underwear. Clean your room. Put your toys up. And, and teach you these things are to follow you through life. Obey those that have the rule over you. Authority. Respect authority. These are the things to follow you to make you a better person, a better human being, a better man, a better woman. They loved you, but they spanked you. So if you say that the love was unconditional, it wasn't that there was no condition put on you. They loved you because the love was in them. So even if you become a thief, they love you, but they don't want you in their house stealing their stuff. Who going to let you steal their rent money when they got to pay rent and they're going to be put outdoors? Mama got to say, hey, son, love you, but you's a junkie. Love you, sweetheart, daughter, dear. Love you, but you's a junkie. Can't let you in my house and steal my rent money. They might let you in a couple of times to steal the DVD, the VCR, the TV, and everything else you can steal. But after a while, it gets monotonous because now they got to replace the things that you stole. So even though they love you, they got to keep you outdoors unless they can keep an eye on you and beat you at the same time. Because if you're stronger than them, ain't no need them letting you in the house if you could beat them because now you're going to overpower. The Bible says, how can the devil overtake a house unless he overpowers a strong man? So if you come in and can overpower them and rob them and beat them down and steal everything they got, they're going to have to stop letting you in the house. That's the condition, not unconditionally anymore. So even if it was unconditionally, you changed the unconditional to condition because you didn't live right. Why is there a hell? And how do you get to heaven? How do you bypass hell? If you go to Revelation, let's go to Revelation. Let's don't just talk. Let's see what the book says. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and 15. And I saw a great white throne. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the book. If, there, why, if there's no condition... If everything is unconditional, how can we be judged? How can God judge us if he's a God that's of unconditional love? Because that would be hypocritical. That would be false. How can you judge me if, if, if everything is unconditional? So you, re you receive the lie. You receive the lie. You receive the lie. You receive the lie. So you want to go to church and you want to continue in homosexuality. You want to go to church and continue being a liar, fornicator, adulterer. Whatever I am that's not of God, I don't want to be it. Let me say that again. Whatever I am that is not of God, I don't want to be it. I'm practicing to be holy. I'm practicing. If I haven't arrived yet, then the Bible said, well, we, the Bible don't say it. But the world says, well, practice makes perfect. And the Bible says in Matthew 5 and 48, be perfect. And in other scriptures, it tells you that God, the Holy Spirit works on you to perfect you. When the Holy Spirit comes in you, you're declared as perfect, even though you're not perfect in the flesh. But the Spirit is perfect. That's why those of you that are listening to me, you need to all be filled with the Holy Ghost. What proves you got the Spirit of God? There are people that live, live morally without knowing God. They don't even believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. But they don't believe in stealing. They don't believe in lying. They don't believe in taking no other man's wife. Because morally, somebody can go upside your head and even take your life for touching their wife or their husband. Not legally in all states. Not even spiritually, according to the Bible. It was in the Old Testament. That's where a lot of people still hold on to the Old Testament. But under the spirit of the new covenant, through Jesus Christ, you got to forgive. Even if somebody stole your girl, stole your man, yes, you got to forgive them. Yes, that's a condition. And you can't do it without the power of God. you like, oh, I hate her. I hate him. I want to kill him. Yeah, you're going to end up in prison, the earthly hell. You don't want that. You want to get that out of your system because you can, you can forgive him. You can forgive her and live on. Whether you be with him or be not with him, whether you, whether you be with her or not with him, there's another him, another her, but you don't want to get another him, another her, and don't be righteous in God, because you don't want to be living a life of adultery. Mm. So you might have to forgive him. I shouldn't even say might. You have to forgive him. You have to forgive her. So does it mean that he just can walk all over you? He shouldn't. She shouldn't. He shouldn't. She shouldn't. 
he shouldn't, she shouldn't, but when they got the devil in them, how did you get with him or her anyway? Did God tell you to get with him or her? The devil's going to show up even in godly marriage. Remember Adam and Eve? The devil showed up and he messed up their marriage. But they still had to go on. God didn't tell her to leave him. He didn't tell him to leave her. No, they had some new stuff going on. They had some punishment, some chastisement that was going on with God. But he didn't say, leave Eve, leave Adam. No. The word is tough, ain't, isn't it? It's tough. Wow. All right, let me finish this out. But if you don't take chastisement, then you're a bastard. Verse 8 of Hebrews 12. Furthermore, we have fathers in the flesh that have chastised us, and we gave them reverence. How much more should we give the Heavenly Father reverence for getting on us? For they, the, our earthly fathers, did it for what they thought was right. But God does it for your holiness. For our profit. God chastises you for your profit. For heaven. Remember we were just reading in Revelation chapter 20. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open. Which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. So what you're doing is being judged right now. So if you didn't have to do any work. That's what James was saying in, in chapter 2. If you don't have no works to do. Righteous works. It it would be no condition, but there is condition. And the sea gave up the dead, Revelations 20 and 13. And the sea gave up the dead which are in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their work. You're going to be judged according to your work, man, woman. So if you keep on walking around here talking about it ain't no condition, but you want other people to treat you right, but you want to treat people the way you want to, that's demonic. That's not Jesus Christ's godliness. That's demonic. Now, it's just like a man. You want to tell a woman what to do. You want her to stay home and be faithful and be monogamous to you, right? Just use an example. But you want to go out and chase women and stick your fishing pole in every pond that you can because that builds you up as a man because you're tired of the same fishing pole, huh? You, you're tired of the same fishing pond, so you can stick your, your fishing rod anywhere you want to. But the woman can't, you know, she can't take her pond for other men to put their fishing pole in it, but you you can take your pole and put it in any pond you want to, but she can't take her pond for men to that's that's not right. Don't you know the Bible said you're gonna reap what you sow set show? So Galatians, I believe it's Galatians six and seven. Be not deceived. That means be not fooled, be not a liar to yourself. Praise the Lord. Amen. Whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. Amen. So you, you do wrong, but you want to beat the woman, curse at the woman, call the woman everything but a child of God because she, you know what I mean, if she does wrong. But you can do wrong because you're tired of the same fishing pole. Well, what if she get tired of the, you, you tired of the same, you, you tired of the same fishing hole? So what if she's tired of the same fishing hole? Let me say it right. You're tired of the same fishing hole. But she's tired of the same fishing pole. So shouldn't she have the same right that you have? Oh, you don't, you, don't, you don't like that, do you? Well, amen. Then you ought to be just as monogamous as she is. You ought to be just as disciplined because as the man, you have the right to, up, up, to uphold the standard of righteousness and holiness. You're the head of the house. You're not the head just to, supposed to be head to tell her to do right. And you live like a Pharisee and scribe and do what you want to do. That's why we got so many diseases, syphilis, gonorrhea, crap, crabs, and whatever else. And then, worst of all, AIDS, HIV. Because man and woman don't want to be right towards one another. The two shall be made one. Like your arm or your foot or any other part of your body. You don't cut it off when it hurts you. You do the best you to bandage up and heal it. Nurture it. You to heal him, heal her. Y'all got to work on each other's healing. That's the condition of being together. Heal her. Heal him. H-E-A-L. H-E-A-L, in case I'm not saying it right. Heal. Heal. Not H-E-E-L. <laughs> your heal. But part of your heal. If your heal hurts, you get heals first. You don't cut your heel off your foot. You put some... You wash your feet, soak them, and massage your heel and the rest of your foot and try to get it to feel better because you need it to walk on. Praise the Lord. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall reap in the flesh, which is corruption. And he that soweth in the spirit shall reap in the spirit life everlasting. So you said, what if I'm doing wrong, uh, right as a man or a woman, and my man or my woman don't treat me right? That's your trial and, tri and, 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 and tribulation. That's a trial and tribulation. That's a trial and tribulation. That's a trial and tribulation. And you have to pray to God that you can be able to get through it. Not by up in his faith, up in her faith. By prayer and supplication. You need to pray more. That's where you need that spiritual tongue now. Not to pray in the flesh. Because if you pray in the flesh, you're going to be saying, he's a heathen, she's a heathen, she ain't no good. She... God don't want to hear that. He already knows that we were sinners. Romans 3 and 23. He already knows that what the wages of sin is. But you need the spirit to help you pray for forgiveness and pray for their right ministering that God sent out of Oshai and of the Yilfei. Since the angel of ministry is to bind the demons in their life. Because a lot of times a man or a woman gets possessed. Even in the church. It's the church that a lot of them is talking about an unconditional love. No unconditional love. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. And verse 14. Revelation 24. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So you got to be written in the book of life. Didn't Jesus say in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come unto the Father but by him? So that's a condition right there. Didn't Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments? John chapter 14. Huh? What well, didn't Jesus say? Why well, say you love me and do not what I say? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I mean, come on now. We talk about this no unconditioned. Don't stop telling people it's of non condition. That's a lie. That's a lie. Even going back in the Old Testament, why was there all a lot of people wiped out? Because of the fact that they are. Uh, disobey God. Why was the flood? Why were only eight people saved? Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, Jephthah, and their three wives. Why were only eight people saved out of who knows how many people were on earth? Why? Why were they all drowned out if there was no condition? Shouldn't they have been on been, God wouldn't have to send the flood. He'd send that to wipe it out. Why is there going to be a fire to wipe out the world? Why is there going to be a new heaven and a new earth if everything was alright if there was no condition? Why was there a new covenant versus the old covenant to overpower the old covenant if, the, if there was no condition? And we didn't meet the old, con old condition. So Jesus came. Why is there a mark of the beast? Revelation chapter 20. Why are people receiving the marks in their head? Why is God calling them unholy if there's no such thing as holiness? Why did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48, be ye holy and perfect? If there's no way of being, you say nobody is perfect. You don't know everybody. Stop telling that lie. If Jesus said be perfect, be holy, somebody is perfect and holy. Even if you don't understand what holy and perfect is. But Matthew 5 and 48, that's what Jesus said. Be holy. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Maybe I made it up. I don't know. Let me go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. I thank you now. Maybe I made a mistake. Let me go read. Now, this is just as he was saying, he was the salt of you are. He was telling the, the disciples they are the salt of the earth and that he was the light of the world. And then when he got to the end of the chapter, he told them about the attitude, his attitude towards adultery. All right. He told them about his attitude towards people making oaths and not keep them and told them to love their enemies. Let's read 48, the last verse of Matthew chapter 5. Be you therefore perfect, even as your father, which is heaven, is, is perfect. So perfection is only going to come through by you being obedient through Jesus Christ and God. So stop walking around here talking about ain't nobody perfect. No, you're not perfect. So you don't see perfection in anyone else, and you don't want to see perfection in anyone else. The scriptures also said in Hebrews 12, this uh, scripture that we end, Hebrews, let's go back to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews, 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 Hebrews 12, I think it's 14. Follow peace with all men, holiness without no man shall see the Lord. So that's telling you that's a condition. If you're not in peace and if you're not in holiness, you're not going to see the Lord. Now, I know it seems a contradiction that says every eye will see and every knee will bow. It's going to see something. You may not see God in his view, in his, in his full glory. 
because you have to be holy to do that. But you see the glimpse of God through Jesus Christ. Uh, follow, yes, Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, because without no man shall see the Lord. So that means you're not going to see the Lord truly as it, because remember the sentence says, does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall see him. Praise the Lord. It says, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, everything is impartial. But my glass is crooked. Well, praise the Lord. I don't know. I mean, no matter how I try to straighten them, amen, they keep on going crooked. Praise the Lord. But anyway, um, we got to follow peace with God. So stop saying there's uncondition there's there's no condition. There are conditions. You gotta live holy. You gotta be born again. Uh, another condition. Oh man. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said you must be born again. Except you're born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God. Again, another, another you shall not see the kingdom of God if you're not born again. I think we need that Holy Spirit speaking with tongues. Well, even if you feel you don't need to be filled with speaking in tongues, ask God to fill you with the Spirit. And however it needs to come, he'll send it. You may have to clean up some. Remember the Old Testament, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, if my people who are called by my name, now the name, it might have been called Je Jehovah, Yahshua in the Old Testament, but now the name is Jesus. So if my people who are called by the name Jesus would humble themselves, condition, humble themselves. Pray, condition, pray. Seek my faith, condition, seek my faith, and turn, condition, turn from their wicked ways. Then, condition means you have to have a one in order to get a two. You got to start out with the first thing to get two. One and one equals two, right? So you got to have one with another to get the other one. If you don't have but one, you're only going to have one. But in order to have two, you've got to get one plus a one. Come on, say amen. So you have to have the condition to get the requirement. Woo! You have to meet the condition to get the requirement. You don't meet the condition, you don't get the requirement. You don't follow peace with all men, you don't see God. You don't follow holiness, you don't see God. You don't humble yourself, seek God, turn from your wicked ways. He won't heal the land. That's enough on that. So I think we prove that God is a God of condition. You don't want to go to heaven? Don't do nothing. Just do what you want to do. Be not deceived. Galatians 6 and 7. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he soweth. Soweth. Works. Condition. Whatever he soweth, you, can, you, can, you reap to the flesh, you get the flesh, which is hell and damnation. You reap to the spirit, which is righteousness, you get your name get found written in the book of life. Come on, how much more can we go? We can go count, we can go on and on. That's enough. Beloved, who wants a man who wants a woman that just dogs them out? You say, I love you, baby, and they just dog you out, curse you out, treat you all kind of way, mentally abuse you, physically abuse you, don't come home at night with other men, with other women, doing whatever they want to do. Nobody wants that. And even if you did love them, you're going, to dis you're going to disperse them from you. You're going to separate them like Matthew chapter 10. Think not that I come to bring peace, but I come to bring a sword. The sword, the word of God is going to separate, amen, the right from the wrong, the sheep from the goats, the heavens from the hell. And you're going to like, man, there's too much hell in this house. Something is wrong. You seek God before you do it in the flesh now. Because you might have to go through more than what you think. What you think is a long time may not be a long time to God. That's why Luke chapter 18 says, pray without ceasing. First uh, Thessalonians 5, 17, I think, says, pray without ceasing. Uh, Luke chapter 18 says, men also always pray and not faint. See, when you think you faint, you got to pray. All right? I pray that you understand the condition of God and stop saying that it's unconditioned. Okay? Even a mother loves a child because the condition is it's her child. Father loves the child because the condition is it's his child. Let this, another boy a girl, a man, a woman, do to a parent what their son or daughter does. They hate them. I hate that man. Let them send them to prison. They only don't want to send their own son or daughter to prison because that's their son. So that's the condition. It's not unconditional. Their own son or daughter curse them out. They forgive them. Come on, eat, baby. Come on home and eat. Come on over. I know you're a grown man, grown daughter, but come on over and eat. Bring the children. Cheering. Bring the children. 
with somebody else doing I don't want to see her no more. I don't want to be bothered with them. Because it's not your child. So the condition that we say is unconditional is a lie. You let family members do things that people on the outside would do and you don't love them. And you forgive your family member because it's your family. That's the condition. It ain't because you're loving them unconditional. You're loving them because that's your family. That's your blood. But get somebody that's not your blood. You want to beat their brains out, blow their head off, kill them, let anything happen to them. But when the love of God comes, since you can forgive your blood family, the love of God says you can forgive her. She's only a thief like your family member. He's only a junkie like your family member. They're only alcoholics like your family members. So you can forgive your family when you love God. Your family extends beyond. Your neighbor becomes your family. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. God loves you, but it's based on condition. You've got to be holy. You've got to be righteous. And only God can help you do that. Well, that's why it says, for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. So you need more Jesus than you know. Like I said, there's so much in God, 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy 3 and 16, without arguing, great is the mystery of God, so much in God. So you